Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, thanks, Becky. Uh, Dave's still an alcoholic. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do next is um, I'm just going to talk you through um, what happens from the point where somebody asks me to be their sponsor to uh, finishing the book work, really. So quite often the way it works, I'm, I'm going to use an book as well. There's my one. I got it out this morning and it was, all the pages were falling out. I didn't have time to stick them back in. Because it's a well-used book. So the pages in my book are well-used. And they're kind of all stuck in with tape and stuff like that. And maybe that's something about my attachment to that particular book, I guess. So I've got Al's book. Thanks, Al. Well, you, uh, not that you've... Uh, I thought you'd let go of that resentment about the old book. Yeah. So you might be at a meeting or, uh, you know, maybe after the meeting or standing outside the meeting or, you know, in the, in the detox unit or, you know, you just answer the phone call from somebody. And uh, quite often they might dither around the question. So, you know, you find folks will ask how you are, you know, did you go to the football, how was that, how's the wife. And, like, you know, when you've been around a while, you know what it is they really want to ask you. Or they start giving some long spiel about how they're stuck in their recovery and things like that. You know. And again, you know if you've been around a while, you know what the question is he really wants to ask it. But see, I'll never make it easy. <laughs> never. Um, I can't enjoy it. Watch him squirm a little bit, you know. Because I, I know he's got to ask, you see. I know that that's an act of humility to say, will you... So and then eventually it asks the question. So you know, I know you're busy, Dave, but you know, and all that and everything. And uh, but I was wondering if you did have a time, and uh, maybe it's possible if we could, in the in the style of Hugh Grant, you know, <laughs> <laughs> would you be my sponsor? And quite often you find that new people don't have that kind of anxiety actually. So if they're at their second or third meeting, they just come up and ask because they don't, they, you know, they're just new, aren't they? You know, so the people that have been around a little bit longer have that kind of anxiety. Stuff. And I won't say yes straight away, never. Because what, what, when he's asked me, see, sponsorship's like a contract, really. Right, and what you need to be clear about uh, in, in embarking upon a sponsorship relationship is what are the terms of the contract. Yeah. So when he's asked me, will you be my sponsor? He's asking either out of desperation. Or, his, or based on his idea of what he thinks the contract is. So he'll have an idea about what he thinks the sponsor is and what he wants from that sponsorship relationship. And that could be very different to what I'm actually offering. Right? You know, he might be somebody who actually does want somebody who's going to sit and listen to him for an hour a week in an informal counselling session. Yeah? And the people who do do that. I mean, and like I said earlier on, you know, it's, everybody can do whatever they want. You know, I really don't mind. I don't want to do that. So I never say yes. What I say is, we need to talk about that. Because we need to be clear about what it is that you're expecting from me and what it is that I offer. And usually I find that people are fine with that. Because actually it helps them. You know, they, they want it actually themselves. They want the, the terms and conditions of the contract clarified anyway. So I normally arrange to meet them in a, in a you know, couple of days' time or whatever. And on neutral grounds, often, I find that first meeting is beneficial. It can be quite intimidating to come to somebody's house and things like that. You know, sort of cold calling, you know, things, you know. So to meet on neutral ground, I find, is quite useful for that first meeting. So I meet at the McDonald's or the coffee shop or whatever it is. You know, and, have a, and we have an initial chat about what it is that's on offer. Yeah. And uh, I, I usually start that conversation 
with um, thanking him for asking me, you know, first of all, because I understand that to ask anybody to be your sponsor is, is quite a big risk, actually. Especially if you've been around a while and you know what's involved in working the steps, and that you're going to be telling people things about yourself and inviting that person into your life uh, on a very kind of intimate kind of basis. So I always thank him for asking me. And then I, I proceed to tell him what it is I don't offer. Because I think that's most important, personally. And I, and I start with, um, well, I don't offer counselling. That's not what I offer in this, in this relationship. And if you ask for clarification around that, I say, well, you know, person-centred counselling is really useful in some situations in life. I've, I've accessed it in, uh, you know, in recovery for various things. And uh can be really helpful. I found it helpful. But as a sponsor in AA, it isn't what I offer. Well, that's not what I offer. So, you know, if you want, think that's going to be helpful for you, then uh, please go and, and find somebody who can do that. And you can do it as well as. See, it's not about saying that uh, I want to do the AA steps and that means I can't do anything else, you know. You can do the AA steps, and you can do personal centered counselling, you can do CBT, you can do uh, psychoanalytic therapy, you can do whatever you want. Well, actually, that's up to you, isn't it? I mean, there's many ways to heal a human being. And um, so I make it clear that I don't offer that. I make it clear that uh, I won't offer him any financial advice. You know? I'll explain to him that being as I've been bankrupt in my life, I figure that that's lost me the right <laughs> to, to advise anybody about managing their finances. But, you know, if he's got problems with his finances, then maybe he should go and speak to the there's various agencies around that can offer that service for you, citizen advice and consumer credit ser counselling service. It could help you with that kind of stuff. I, uh, so I don't offer relationship advice. You know, I don't do that. Um, you know, if he's got problems with relationships, usually they have, you know. Usually the problem is the relationship that they've got, or the problem is that they haven't got a relationship. Yeah. Anybody relate to that? They're both relationship problems, aren't they? I don't offer any advice about that. There are organisations in, uh, in society that can do that, relate as one. Marriage guidance and things like that. I don't offer marriage guidance. I'm happily married now. Um, but to get to the point where I've been happily married, I've had some disastrous relationships. So, uh, I'm an expert on relationships because I've had loads of them. It doesn't mean I can give advice about them. So I don't offer that kind of advice. Um, and then I, I say to them, I don't actually offer any advice at all. And they say, what? Well, I don't do financial advice, I don't do relationship, marriage guidance advice. And actually, I don't do any advice. Outside of that arrangement, either, I don't do any. They say, what do you mean? And I say, well, see, my, my position with this is that your life's your life. Decisions you make are your decisions. You own them, not me. I'm not making your decisions for you, because then you can come and blame me later when they go wrong. Why would I do that? I said, also, I understand for the time I've been sober and things I've seen, in that in some situations you might be the best person to make your decisions rather than somebody else. See, there's a, a lot, some people in AA talk about the sponsor always knowing better. And I, you know, I dispute that. Does he always know better? You know, I've got two psychology degrees and a master's degree in social work. And my first sponsor was a gangster who'd read one book. Does he know more about behavioural psychology than me? Probably not. <laughs> so I allow people to understand that I'm not there to control their life. Right? Now, it goes one of two ways. Some people are delighted about that, because what they've been worried about is that they're going to lose some kind of autonomy from having a sponsor. And some people are concerned about it, because what they want is somebody to take responsibility for them. And there are some people, young men, it's uh, particularly apparent in young men, that actually want somebody to tell them what to do. Yeah? 
they're seeking that. And then, then people don't do well under my sponsorship. They tend to end up going somewhere else where they do better. I don't change what I offer based on the person sat across. I offer what I offer because of the reasons I spoke about earlier on today. So I explain to them that their decisions are their own. I won't interfere in that. I then ask them for a couple of things. So, you know, the first thing that I ask for is that you will be prepared to go to any lengths for your recovery. And it, usually they say yes, they don't really know what that means. You know, do we, any of us really know what any links means? I, I didn't know. And then uh, I thought maybe it meant you had to travel a long way. You know, right to the end of the central line or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I asked him, like my sponsor first asked me, he said, you know, I'm quite happy to do this work with you, Dave, if you promise me that when we're finished you'll carry it to another boat carry this message. And uh, I ask him that, I say, you know, I'm quite prepared to do this work with you. As long as you say to me that when we're finished, you're prepared to carry this to another boat. And usually they say yes, meaning no, but hoping that you can't see the fact that they're lying. <laughs> Smart experience. Body language is a giveaway. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, when I shared the story earlier on about the first bloke that asked me, so my sponsor said to me, you know, why don't you do it? It might make you learn this program you've been talking about, Dave. But then he also said, do you remember that promise you made me? See? He said, you made me a promise, didn't you? you remember, son? He said, when we finish with this work, you'll carry it to someone else. Now, here's your chance. See, and it was that promise that I made him that enabled me to become a sponsor. I don't think I would have done it otherwise. You know, it was to pay my debt to him. And through doing that that first time, I was able to then do it some more and experience the joys that come from inviting them other people into my life. So I'll get him to say that. I, I ask him um, if he's prepared to do that. Um, I ask him uh, for anonymity in sponsorship. There are two reasons why I do that. Um, the first one is kind of a, it's redundant now, really. But years ago in AA, I got quite unpopular. And lots of people didn't really like me very much. And um, to the point that I used to get death threats. And uh, from other side of members of the fellowship. So I wouldn't want the people that I work with to have to experience that. You know, I say, look, you know, to protect yourself, if someone asks you who your sponsor is, just tell them it's none of their business. Yeah. And then the second reason is about my ego. Yeah. So, you know, I don't want to be in a position where I'm the big I am with all these sponsees thinking that I know everything. So, you see, nobody knows who I sponsor. It's very difficult for that to occur. So I ask for that anonymity. But the bottom line is, you know, if people are asking you who your sponsor is, well, it's none of their business really, is it? Yeah. There are some, are some people who like to use the sponsor like a top trump card. Do you know what I mean? You know, you're talking in your meetings in AA, and so-and-so says, well, my sponsor's this person. Oh, yeah, but I've got this person. You know. And he, he, he goes 270 miles an hour, whereas your one only goes... <laughs> Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It kind of helps prevent that as well. A little bit. So. <laughs> so then he's sitting there and he's uh, and he's either, either wants to do it or he doesn't. Right? That's the that's the reality, isn't it? You know, I, I explain what I offer. You know, I say what I offer. So this is what I don't offer. These are the things I, I require from you, and this is what I offer. That's a journey through the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I would expect you to come to me once a week. And we will read through this book, and as we go through the book, we will take the actions that the book suggests. Yeah. And, uh, sounds quite simple. And then uh, we might have some general conversation, and he's quick, keen often to proceed straight away. 
or to give me an answer that, you know, it's quite difficult to say no when somebody's sitting across from you. Right. So I'm aware of that. So I say to him, look, don't give me your answer now. Right. Go home, sit on it for two days, a couple of days, 48 hours. My mate Dan always used to say, think on something for 48 hours before you make your decision. But a lot of things change in 48 hours. And then give me a call. And we'll see where we go. A lot of the time, you know, they ring up and they say, I wanted to ring you yesterday and I really want to do it, you know. But I have had a few people that after thinking about it for 48 hours have realised that isn't really what they want from that relationship with, with a sponsor. Yeah. They want something different. And, they, and they, they continue to seek that, you know, they find someone else to facilitate that. So if everybody did exactly the same thing, I think in some way, shape or form, AA would be diminished by that. So if everybody did it exactly the way that I did it, you know, there'd probably be a whole load of people that that really wouldn't be effective for, actually. Yeah. So it's about, uh, for me, it's about remembering that and encouraging that man then to find where he needs to go. You know, and if he asks me, I might offer him some suggestions. You know, and he's saying, well, that's not really what I'm looking for. What I'm interested in is this. I said, well, maybe you should go to this meeting, or I've got this bloke here, this number, maybe you should bring him. You know, that kind of stuff. And then we'll arrange to meet um, the following week. I usually, I usually only meet with people for no longer than about an hour and a half. And um, my experience, the reason why that is, is that my experience working with people is that that's pretty much the limit of anybody's concentration span, especially when they're new. You're lucky to get an hour and a half out. Yeah. I, I used to, and I've done a few times when uh, the situation has, has warranted it, taken through, taking people through the program in a day. I've done that a couple of times. Well, there's, there's friends of mine in, in fellowship, other fellowships who do that. Yeah. It can be a valid way of doing stuff. I think often what what goes wrong down the line is that that person doesn't have a structure that they can pass on and often they don't make very good sponsors themselves. So I think that meeting with people in a structured way over a course of weeks, i found, then gives them some kind of framework which they can rely on when they're frightened to do it as a sponsor. Not having to rely on their memory of one day's events. So we meet the first time, and the, fir the first sit-downs, um, often he's, he's a bit nervous. You know, he come round, we have a cup of tea, make a cup of tea, have some general conversation. And he's got his big book. I used to, I used to make a point, uh, I think I heard uh, Cliff Bishop, he was saying that uh, if people don't turn up with a big book, he'd send them home. Didn't he? And then, uh, so I did that once, some bloke turned up once. He didn't have his big book with him, and I sent him home. And I was sitting there, I think, that's stupid, I've got four big books on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't do that. But, uh, you know, I understand the principle of that. You know, are, are you coming prepared to do what we're supposed to be doing? You know, carrying a big book in your hand is an indication that you are uh, coming with that intention. So... But uh, my wife's in the fellowship. We've got loads of big books. Yeah, haven't we? So anyway, we sit down and we start reading the doctor's opinion. And uh, a lot of big book sponsors start with the preface and the forewords. In fact, I think most big book sponsors do that. Um, that I know. Um, the reason I don't is that uh, my experience has shown me that um, quite often I'll only see somebody once whatever reason. Yeah. So I think that if I'm only, I always go with never knowing whether this person's going to make it. So I don't. You know, I've got no idea what the outcome's going to be for anybody. So I always think, how, what's the thing that I can give him that's going to be most helpful if I only see him once? It's probably the information in the doctor's opinion. It's probably the most useful thing I'm doing. So we read through the doctor's opinion, and um, I think one of the one of the arts of being a sponsor in in recovery, who's been around a while, is to try and always remember where the new man is. 
right? I can't actually put myself in his place because it's physically impossible to do that. But I can remember what it was like not to understand what the book was talking about. You know, and I couldn't. And I'm well educated. I couldn't really grasp the concepts that the book was on about. Yeah. And so when you've been around a while and you've kind of maybe read the book hundreds of times, you've been to lots of meetings and you've got elaborate ideas around some of the things in the book, you've got lots of things highlighted in your book and underlined, things that are important, it can be difficult to keep it simple for the new man. So the way, the way that I do that, the way that I endeavour to do that, is I just read the words on the page. No more, no less. Now, I, don't, uh, I don't have elaborate discussions about certain sentences and what they may or may not mean. I don't uh, talk about the, the history of certain lines or things like that. Or how it may have changed from the, the first edition to the second edition. Yeah. Or what that may or may not have meant to Clarence Snyder in 1939. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah. I'll just read the the words on the page. And then um, what I've, what I've realised is that uh, people's understanding uh, either comes from how to read that or not. Right? But you, get, you get an opportunity all the time to reinforce learning. So I'll read through it once with them. Um, and I, I do the reading. you know. And the reason I do that is that what I've found, I know that some sponsors, they share the reading, so they do a page each and stuff like that. And... Uh, you know, that's you know, perfectly valid. But um, what I've realised over the years is that quite often uh, some people are anxious about reading. Uh, some blokes I've worked with over the years haven't been able to read at all when they come to AA. You know, things like that. So it's, you know, I take the pressure off of them when I do the reading. Yeah. Also, they need to be able to listen and try and absorb some of that information. Not be concentrating on, on being able to pronounce a word properly. You know, worried about what I might think of them if they stumble over a word, things like that. So I try and be considerate of that. And I just do the reading. And uh, so then the challenge as a sponsor, see how many times have I read the doctor's opinion? Hundreds. Right. They say, I can read the doctor's opinion and if I'm not practicing presence, I can be doing my shopping list, having an argument with Liana, and read at the same time. It's great. But what it gives me is an opportunity always just to practice presence. See, because I'm doing this out of service. So I just do it, and I read it, and it's about me being present with that. With that new person. Well then, uh, I'll then elaborate on a, a couple of sections, after we've read through it once, to uh, talk about the phenomenon of craving. So it says on XXVIII, we believe, as I suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol and his chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. Once having formed the habit, found they cannot break it. Once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon human things, their problems pile up and then become astonishingly difficult to solve. Difficult to solve. And it says on the, the following page, all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy, which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been, by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. And I will then just tell him a couple of stories. You know, most of you will have heard my stories if you've been in meetings with me. I use very simple stories. You know, I'll talk about my train station experiences. You know, my inability to get home at night. You know, through once having started to drink, the craving becoming paramount in my life and other concerns, meaning that I was unable to do what I probably intended to do before I started to drink. And the reason why I pick the simple stories is that it's to avoid the kind of uh, war story top trump thing that we do. <coughs> do you know what I mean? You know, because everybody will identify. If they're an alcoholic, Everybody will identify with lack of control. Right? When you start to drink, having a lack of control over the amount that you drink. Not everybody will identify with going to prison, beating your wife, crashing the car, losing the job. That stuff happens as a consequence as a, of being unable to control the amount. Yeah, but it's about the key things about control. I never talk about the quantity that I drink. Because I understand that for people, they're hooked up on that when they first come in. The definition that most mainstream 
uh, mainstream sources use of uh, an alcoholic will be in some way, shape or form based on quantity. So there'll be like safe limits of alcohol that you can drink and unsafe limits that you can't have. You know, unit things that the government likes to promote and stuff like that. And so I never talk about quantity. I never say that I drank, you know, two bottles of this or whatever. I just talk about not being able to control it. And what you'll find is, is that if you can use the simple language, they'll identify if they are, and if they won't, they won't. Yeah. Of all the people I've worked with, I've only ever had two people that I've got to this point with that haven't been able to identify the phenomenon of craving. So that suggests to me that well, one of them came back later. So probably one. But I know one. I think the cases of mistaken identity in our fellowship were quite low. Quite low. I think in our society in, uh, in England, we have a very uh, socially acceptable tolerance of alcoholic drinking. So if you've got a problem with alcohol and you've ended up in AA, you're probably quite bad. Yeah? Very few cases of mistaken identity in my experience. So that would be the, the first meeting. Um, I'll, then, I'll send him away with an exercise, um, which is, uh, it's not in the book, but I think it's helpful, is that I will, I'll ask him to write down uh, a couple of experiences in his life when the phenomenon of the craving become paramount in his life. Right. So that's uh, a couple of times when he's gone out to start, gone out to, to drink, but expecting to come home at a certain time or do something different. Just two experiences. I'll get him to write down the, uh, the five most insane things he's done whilst drunk. Uh, you know, crashed a car, yeah. got arrested, yeah. broke into a kebab van. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Stole a camel, that was me. And then the last part is to, to consider. I ask him to consider the possibility that he might be the average temperate drinker. You notice in one of the little paragraphs I just read from the big book, uh, Dr. Siltwell's opinion, it talks about this allergy, this phenomenon of the craving, differentiating us from the average temperate drinker. It never occurs in them. So the average temperate drinker never, not once in his life, experiences that phenomenon of craving, ever. So I'll get him, I'll get the, the new man to, to consider that. And I'll say, don't just give yourself a straight answer straight away. You know, sit with it. Ask yourself the question over and over. And what that's designed to do is to, because uh, you're either one or the other. Yeah? You've either had the phenomenon of craving in your life, which means you're the alcoholic of the type described in this book, or you haven't. So is it possible that you could be the average temperate drinker? And by thinking about that, he may be able to surrender to the idea that he is an alcoholic. Helps with that. I'll get him to come back the following week, and then the following week we do chapters two and three together. And the reason why we miss Bill's story is because, uh, again, like I spoke about before, I might only see him twice. Yeah? If you come back the second time, there's no guarantee he's going to come back the third time. So what's the next most important information I can give him? Chapters 2 and 3. So I've given him the first part in the first week, the physical. Second part, second week, is the mental. See, chapter 2 introduces us to this concept that... Uh, if the, if the problem was just physical, yeah. all he'd have to do is choose not to drink and he'd be alright, wouldn't he? That's it, isn't it? If you just got physical, you just got the allergy going on, choose not to do it, don't come to AA, Bob's your uncle. Before we do the reading, I'll get him to tell me his two things that he's written down about his phenomenon of craving. You know. Just to get him thinking about his drinking story. See, and the reason I do that early on 
it's partly so that he can start to create a narrative around that. Right? Because what makes you most effective later on as a sponsor, if you've got a clear understanding of your own drinking story. If you haven't, you'll never be able to help people in here. That's my experience. So lots of really spiritual people who don't understand their drinking story can't really help people. In here. So I read through chapter 2 and uh, on page 24 we sort of spend a little bit of time thinking about the fact is that most alcoholics for reasons yet obscure have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times most important to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago, we are without defence against the first drink. <coughs> I tell him about my experiences at the train station. How uh, there were times I walk across the concourse at London Bridge and I think to myself, I'm going to the host house on the corner there, have a pint, worked hard today, and I wouldn't. I'll say no. I know what happens when I go in there. I go in there, I drink till I can't control it, and I end up with the last train home, falling asleep, waking up in Ramsgate. I don't want to do that, and I wouldn't go in there. Yeah. Maybe a few days ago past, and I've been walking across the concourse at London Bridge, and the thought will pop in my mind. You've got five minutes till your train comes, though. You could have a quick pint. And it'll be like a little seesaw moment. Maybe that's not such a good idea, you know, but one won't hurt. At that moment, I was unable to bring into my mind with sufficient force the memory of the suffering of even a week or a month ago. Simple stories. Keep it simple for people. We get through that chapter, so I've introduced him to the idea of the insane twist of the mind that precedes the first drink in chapter 2, which is the intention of chapter 2. Right? And it outlines in chapter 2 that there is a solution to that. It outlines that the solution to that is spiritual in nature. So at the end, when we finish chapter 2, we normally make a cup of tea, and I'll get him to tell me his five most insane things that he's written down from the week before. And uh, he say something like, well, I was in Ibiza, <laughs> And I had a few drinks and I beat my mate up. And I was really ashamed of myself. You know, we just had a row about nothing, can't even remember what it was about. We had a fight and I beat him up. And the following day I remember thinking to myself, I ain't going to drink again. It was awful. I said, alright, oh, okay, it sounds bad. You know? yeah. So did you drink again after that? He said, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did have a drink again. So the next time you picked up a drink, what was you thinking? He said, what do you mean? <coughs> what do you mean, what was I thinking? I don't know. He said, I don't know, I don't really know. I said, no, I said, well, think about it. The moment before you picked up that first drink, what was going through your mind? I don't know, it was just what I was going to have a drink. <coughs> Enjoy myself, have a night out. So what was you thinking about beating your mate up? Was you thinking that you're going to go out tonight and kick the shit out of your mate again? No. It wasn't really, no it wasn't. It wasn't in my mind. Okay. I'll get him to tell me another one. Yeah. Got arrested for drink driving. Lost my licence, which meant I lost my job. Oh, that's serious, isn't it? Did you drink again after that? Oh yeah, I had a drink. I had a drink the next day. So, so what was you thinking when you had a drink the next day? What was going on? Well, before I had a drink, I said, yeah. He said, oh, he said, oh I, just wanted, I just wanted to get rid of the hangover. I said, was you thinking about what the consequences might be if you're having another drink? He said, no. No, not really. No, not at all. Then he says, I said, what's the next one? Oh, I said, bad one, he says. I got drunk in blackout, beat my wife up. Shamed myself for that. He said, I told her I weren't going to drink again after that. I said, did you drink again? Oh yeah, he said, I did drink again. 
I didn't drink for a couple of weeks. I said, what's going through your mind when you picked up a drink the next time? He said, well, he said, I, I just ended up in the pub with my mate and he offered me a drink and I took one. I said, well, what was you thinking? He said, I just thought I'd have a drink. I said, what was you thinking about your wife or what might happen after you drank? And he said, no. I'm starting to introduce him to starting to think about the mindset of the chronic alcoholic. I'll suggest to him that the most insane thing he's done in his life isn't them things at all that he's written down. He's going back and having another drink after doing them things. The most insane thing for the alcoholic is that he will drink again thinking this time it will be different or not really remembering what happened last time in its full clarity. Yeah. And is it alleged starting to shake now? Oh, you know, it's going, what, what, what? Yeah. If, you, if you know this stuff, you learn it, right, and you get good fluent with your own stories, you can make, you can, you can enable a surrender moment in people with these chapters. They're most important. Don't skip them. The um, sponsorship for me really took off when I started doing all of this stuff at that. Yeah, I used to think the important stuff came in steps 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. It isn't. Most important stuff in this book is step 1. Which is why most of it's about step 1. Okay. Don't ever think it's a waste of time. So anyway, we then move on to chapter 3. and It's spinning a bit now. And chapter 3 piles it on. Piles it on. Fantastic chapter. You know? We go through that chapter. It defines alcoholism. You know? It says you've got to, the first step is to concede that you're an alcoholic, which is what we're doing with him now. We're teaching him what alcoholism is. Yeah? <coughs> Gives two relapse examples in, the, in, that, uh, in that chapter. A guy called Fred a guy called Jim. One of the big myths in the fellowships is that you're going to get a warning. Hmm? And often some of the language that we've used in the fellowships has uh, enabled people to think that that's the case. You know, we talk about uh, the condition being a physical allergy and a, a mental obsession. And the problem with using that language is, is, first of all, it's not in the book. In one of the, uh, the four words it's used as a phrase, mental obsession. And in the main text, it's not used as that. The, the mental part of our condition isn't called a mental obsession. It's called no effective mental defense. And the reason why that can be misleading is that people relate that language to the idea of other types of obsession that they have. You know, obsession with a girl, a football club, the preoccupation with it. You know, think about it a lot. It's on my mind a lot. I'm obsessed with it. It's all I think about. And so often they say in you in the rooms, the obsession's been removed. You feel safe, doesn't it? Obsession's been removed. Don't go and got it no more. Don't think about it anymore. It's gone. Yeah. Which is nice. But it isn't that that made you pass. And the danger of thinking that it was that kind of thinking that makes you pass is that it leads you to a full sense of security and make you think that you'll get a warning before you drink. That I'll wake up one day, it'll be all over me like a rash. I'll be obsessing about it and I'll be able to up my meetings and ring my sponsor. Wilson smashes that in chapter 3. Smashes it to bits. There's two examples. A guy called Jim. He got up in the morning, no intention of drinking. Wasn't all over him like a rash, just went into a roadside place that sold, that sold liquor. I think we call them pubs, don't we? Right? 
and he had a sandwich looking for a customer. I don't know, do you sell cars in pubs? I don't know. <laughs> and the thought popped in his mind that as long as he mixed it with milk, he could have a whiskey. Just a momentary thing. At that moment. See, at that moment, Jim was unable to bring into his mind with sufficient force the memory of the suffering of even a week or a month ago. And he picked up a drink. And he'd just, he just done six stints in the asylum. Jim. You know, he ain't having a good time. He ain't been having a good time with the drinking. You know. Momentary thing. No warning. Fred. Fred, not clouding the horizon for Fred. End of a perfect day. Right? Oh, Fred, he's loving it, isn't he? He's having a great day. Eh? A couple of cocktails with dinner won't hurt. Maybe a highball. I thought, as he crossed the hotel lobby, no intention of drinking that day, none. And what, if, you, if you can read through this stuff, with that man already in a position of kind of starting to understand the mindset of a kind of alcoholic, you can watch him surrender in front of your very eyes. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen to people with 20 years sobriety. Been in AA 20 years. Sat with me with this book. <coughs> surrender in front of my eyes. Weeping their eyes out. Not understanding how they've been able to stay sober as long as they have. So he often leaves this meeting feeling a bit deflated. I say to him, it's okay. It's all right, you know. He said, why? Have you got a solution? Yeah, we're all right. We're going to do all right. Yeah. Do you think this is true for you? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I can see now clearly that when I started to drink, I had no control. Um, when I stopped, I had no power not to start again. Yeah. He comes back the following week. We do Bill's story. We're going backwards now. She's got the important stuff, and we go through Bill's story. Through Bill's story, we read through Bill's story, and uh, I'll point out to him in Bill's story that the, the various occasions when Bill's relapsed, experienced no uh, no choice, and when he's started to drink and got no control. Uh, I, know, I know some of you get hooked up on this kind of idea of the alcoholic personality and the, the defects of character stuff. And although that might be true for you, it's not really an important part of this for the newcomer. The early chapters of the book talk about drinking. What he wants when he comes here is not to drink. Uh, the following week we do uh, chapter 4, which is where we agnostics or we antagonists, as it's sometimes known. And um, this introduces the idea of a higher power. So we've completely smashed him and deflated him right, in them early chapters. He's maybe got some understanding of what's wrong with him. And now we're going to start to introduce to him the idea of uh, what his solution is. I have to go back, sorry. When, when I have that meeting with him in McDonald's, I'll give him the daily suggestions. So he's praying every day. He's uh, writing a gratitude list. He's reading the big book. I suggest that he rings me. I don't insist on it. Uh, some people do. I've only ever had one bloke all the years I've done this who's rang me every day throughout the course up to step nine. Everybody else has missed or stopped doing it. You know. And, um, yeah, it's there if you want it. Isn't it? it can be a useful thing to get into the habit of ringing your sponsor. I think especially for men, you know, because uh, quite often, you know, I'm not likely to ring you when I'm in trouble. You know, I'm too prideful. Yeah. So if I'm in the habit of ringing someone, I'm more likely to ring somebody if I'm having a difficult time. So we agnostics, we start to introduce the, uh, the concept of a power greater than yourself. Uh, been able to solve all of your problems. Not just your alcohol problem. Yeah. What the book says, doesn't it? It says, it says right, God solve all your problems. Big promise, isn't it? Yeah. Following week we do uh, chapter 5. And then, uh, so we, we read through. Every time the bloke comes back, I'll ask him two questions as soon as I answer the door. Answer the door I'll say to him, 
Why is it not safe for you to drink alcohol? You say, what? When you first do it? You say, I don't know. You say, is it because when you put alcohol into your system, you trigger off this phenomenon of craving, which means that you find it difficult to control and moderate the amount that you drink? He says, yeah, that's it. I say, give me an example of that. And he's written out to you, see, earlier on. And he say, oh, you know, I used to go out to the pub Friday night and I'll do this. He's starting to learn his story. And I say to him, what, what is it that you're unable just to rely on choosing to leave it alone? Why is that? He say, uh, is it because of the uh, strange, strange defence spot? <laughs> when you know this stuff, you don't forget it. Right? But to learn it seems to be really difficult. And sometimes it takes some of my blokes up to the ninth step to be fluent with their understanding of the, full, the first step. I reinforce the learning every time I see them. I ask them, how much alcohol is it safe for you to drink? And they say, none. I say, why is that? Yeah. What happened the last time you chose not to drink? What happened to you? So he's teaching them to get fluent with his story. Because I know that when it comes to him helping others, that's going to be the key. So chapter 5, the next meeting, we go through up to the step 3 stuff. And then we do the step 3 prayer together. You know, I don't, I don't over-elaborate that. You know, there's no big song and dance about it. We just read the words and say the prayer. Yeah. I don't like to dramatise this stuff. I don't know quite matter of fact about it. I think it's a textbook, it's a course, isn't it? Uh, we then go through the rest of the chapter, and we have a chat about inventory. I'll uh, print him off some copies of the inventory sheets that I use for the, the people at this stage, and uh, I'll show him how to fill them in, and I'll send him on his way, tell him to come back the following week. And this is an extra week that I introduced, because I send people away with the inventory sheets, and then they'd, they'd be filling them in happily, and then they turn up to do their fifth step, and they've done it all wrong. You know, got the wrong end of the stick, putting things in the wrong column. Uh, things like that. So I always get them back the following week. I tell them to write out a couple and come back and see me so that I can shape it up for them to make sure that... Otherwise, it's such a waste of time for them. You know. So they write a couple out, they come back, and when they're back on that visit that week, we go through the preface and the forewords. Right, so we use that session for that. A lot of really helpful stuff in there. Really good gear in that stuff. You know. I'll shape up the inventory for them, tell them about the importance of having a concise second column. By far the biggest mistake in inventory writing I see on a regular basis is too much information in the second column. Second column is one sentence, no more. If there's a comma in there, it's too long. If it's two sentences, it's too much. More than one sentence is even more than one resentment or self-justification. One of them two things. Sometimes people don't want to write the fact. They want to write how they feel about that fact and the reasons why they did what they did and how it's unfair. <coughs> the trouble is, if you can't write a concise second column, your third column would be inaccurate and your fourth column would be misleading. You only get a limited amount of freedom from that. Second column is the key to writing good inventory. People talk an awful lot about the fourth column, don't they? Second column's a key, in my experience. And what it also means is that if you get them writing concise second columns, you don't have to listen to hours upon hours of self-justification when you listen to their fifth step. It's a win-win situation, eh? <laughs> well, I learned that from experience. You know, being uh, holed up in, uh, in rooms with people. wanting to tell me why it was everybody else's fault. <laughs> um, normally people are a bit, uh, they think, well, you know. So I say to them, uh, how long do you think it's going to take you to write this full step? And they think, they can see the little cogs are turning. They think, how long can I get away with it, thinking? But they know by now that, you know, asking for a year or so is completely out of the question. Sometimes they go the other way and they think, oh, I, need to, I need to demonstrate my worth here. I'll have it done next week, Dave. 
Alright, well, I mean, it's entirely possible you could write it in a week, but maybe you want to give yourself a little bit more of a window. You know. Oh, right, then, yeah, okay. Some people think, oh, I'll ask for three, three months. I say, well, you know. In my experience, six weeks is about the average. I'll just say it like that. In my experience, six weeks is about the average. If he still wants three months, he can have three months. But generally speaking, people say, oh, okay, I'll right, six weeks, two months. And I'll get them to give themselves a deadline. Right, not imposed by me. So I say, so what day do you think you're going to have this finished on? And we put it in the calendar, and that'll be the day that we do the fifth step. Oh, I didn't expect you to do that. Oh, no, it's important. We need to have a, you know, because I'm busy. You know, I need to make sure that my time's planned. And so we put the day in. And what it gives people is a self-imposed deadline, you know, which is important. Because if it's open-ended, if you're anything like me, they won't do it. Do it at the last minute, do it the night before, don't you? Before the deadline. Most people. Yeah. Frantically writing out your sheets five minutes till the sponsor comes around. <laughs> yeah. So we arranged to do the fifth step, and I, I, I um, you know, I hear people talking about doing the fifth step when they're driving in the car and things like that, and, uh, you know, I'm sure it's entirely possible to do things like that, you know. And, uh, I think it's, uh, it talks in the book about it being a life or death errand. Life or death, serious. Serious business, eh? Life or death errand. And so I'll give it a bit of reverence, really, you know. So I don't know, over-dramatise the text, but I, I treat the, the fifth step process with a bit of uh, sacredness, really. You know, I'll give it a bit of respect. And I ask the man where he'd like to do it. You know, and I say to him, there are some places that often I go with people where we do it. You can go there if you want. If you'd rather do it at home, I'm happy to come to you. It's the one time I'll go to them. And they'll do what they want. Yeah. Be comfortable. Quite often we go down to Aylesford or somewhere like that. Or we might have a place that he wants to go to. And um, I'll ask him, uh, you know, when he's coming up to that finishing point, how many sheets have you got? See, I've got good at this now. I know how long it takes. This is 562. Oh, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare, isn't it? And then, uh, you know, never nearly anywhere near that. No, 50 is probably about the average. 50 pieces of inventory. Some people have a couple of hundred. I've had, uh, I've had blokes that have, have literally had half a dozen pages of A4. That's it. You know. And you know what, right, the, the difference that that makes in a person's recovery seems to me to be none. Right? What, it, what it's about is whether you've given it your best shot, done it to the best of your ability, not left anything out on purpose. Yeah? Inventory is an acquired skill. I never criticise people's inventory at this point. When I'm listening to their inventory, I don't tap and say, oh, you've messed up the columns. Just sit and I listen. Yeah? A lot of people have had judgment all their life. Not been good enough at school, not been good enough for the teachers, not been good enough for the prison, not been good enough for this, that and the other. The last thing they need from their sponsor is another kicking. It's the last thing they need. Yeah? Inventory is an acquired skill. I've got good at inventory for writing lots of inventory over many years. Yeah, they've got time to grow and learn. I don't need to kick them to death now. So I listen. Before we start, I'll share with them my experience with the fifth step. I'll tell them the couple of things about me that I withheld or tried to withhold from my first sponsor as a, as a way to show them that I'm prepared to be entirely honest and that now you have information on me as well, maybe you'll feel more comfortable with sharing with me. And then I listen. And whilst they're reading, I make two lists from my notepad. I make a list of the character defects, and I make a list of the harms that they cause to others. Just the names. And you're pulling that out as they're reading through that fourth step, that fifth step. After they finish reading the fifth step, I uh, present them with the list of defects of character, and we read through the step six and seven reading in the book. I then send them away for an hour on their own. 
to think about what they've done and to ask themselves the question whether they've missed anything out. As they're building an archway through which they walk to a new freedom. You sit for an hour. Sometimes that'd be in St. Jude's Chapel down at Ellsford. But if you've never sat for an hour on your own in a quiet place, it'd be a really long time. I'll leave them in there for an hour and then I'll go and pick them up. I'll say, right, okay, so where are we now with this? Then defects on that list, are you willing for them to go? And we discuss maybe ones that they aren't. I'll share some experience around that with my defects. I'll ask them whether they missed anything. Sometimes they have. You know, often not intentionally. You know, just that whilst they've been sitting there for that hour, something's become apparent to them that they've been thinking that they missed in that written process. And we share that. And after we've had that little chat, we walk into one of the chapels or we do it in the uh, in the lounge or wherever we are, uh, by the settee, and uh, we kneel together and say the step seven prayer. So one day, that's all. It's often just a few hours. Steps four, five, six and seven. As we're going away or driving home, as I'm leaving, I'll give them the step eight list that I drew out as they were reading. I'll tell them to come around the following week. Come around the following week, we do the, the step eight and nine reading in the big book. I'll give them some sheets that, that we've, I've written for them to prepare their step eight inventory on. And the way that I look at that now is that there's a, there's a four columns in that. I like four columns. And it, the first column's about the person or the institution that you cause harm to. The second column is the nature of the cause of the harm. Did you interfere with their self-esteem, their relationships, uh, their ambitions or their emotional security? Did you steal money? And the third column is about how did that affect you? See, this is to get people thinking about you know, when we harm others actually has an effect on us. There is no free ride. And I didn't realise that. You know, when I harm other people it affects me. And then I'll get them to consider what it would have been like if somebody had done what they'd done to them. Walk a mile in that other man's shoes. What would it have been like? How would you have felt if someone had done that to you? And the point of that exercise is it's a willingness tool. Right? Just to shift the consciousness another little degree so that you can become entirely willing to do them step nine amends. And they come around with that piece of work and we go through them all one by one. And we discuss the options for making amends. And there's three ways of making amends. There's direct amends wherever possible, as guided by the book. There's indirect amends where that's not possible. And sometimes you can do both. Because indirect amends can be ongoing. And when either of them two things are possible, you can hand it over to your higher power. And we discuss each situation in turn, using the guidance in the book and my experience. We, we draw up a list of action plan of action for the man to carry out. And one word of caution I'd give to all, all new sponsors, you know, you don't have to have all the answers. Right? Now if you don't know at that meeting what you think is the right course of action, sit with it, both pray on it for a couple of weeks, take some counsel from somebody else. Yeah? There's no emergencies in AA as such in that amends process. A few weeks here or there ain't going to make much difference. Some of my amends are outstanding for 20 years. You know, because they happened a long time ago. So waiting a few weeks either side of that, it's not going to make much difference. I think it's where sponsorship comes into its own in that step nine. You know, I think my, my sponsor was useful, very useful. Some of the guidance that he gave me was life changing. Yeah. So we learn this stuff as we go along. Hand in hand, shoulder by shoulder with the new man, we work together. You know, I became a good sponsor through being a sponsor. I didn't start off as a great sponsor. No. I did my best. He goes and makes them amends and uh, now I start to eke out the time between our meetings. So you talked earlier on about there being a dependency. You know, or the potential for dependency because of the power imbalance in the relationship. And so I start to increase the length of time between our meetings. So rather than, he's used to come around every week. I mean, that's what he's been doing, hasn't he? He's come around every week, pretty much. 
So the next meeting will be in two weeks, and then the next one after that will be three weeks, the next one after that will be four weeks, and then it will be six weeks, and then it will be eight weeks, and then I won't see him probably, unless he wants to. I'll gradually ease myself out of their life. So the next meeting we do steps 10 and 11 together in the big book. And I'll give him uh, daily inventory sheets, uh, talk to him about following the uh, step 11 guidance in the big book. You know, and send him away to work with that. Often that initial practice I'll give him for four weeks. You know, he would come back in four weeks time. We'll do uh, chapter 7, talk about working for others. And I'll give him a new practice with the step 11 stuff. And I'll keep that going, really, for as long as they want to do it. You know, I'll, I'll sit with people and teach them meditation. You know, that's the way that I do that. You know, I found that when I used to say to people, go and find some sources of meditation and practice meditation, they'd never do it. So I found that for me, I had to sit with them and show them how to do that. I offer them books that have been useful to me. So quite often in that meeting when we're doing the Step 7 reading, they'll walk away from my house with the Meditation for Dummies book. You know, I remember there was a bloke that I worked with and uh, I was around his house and he was about eight months sober. He said, oh, I read this really excellent book on meditation, Dave. I said, oh yeah. Yeah, Meditation for Dummies, have you ever read it? And I thought, does he know who he's talking to? <laughs> but you know, I kept me cool. I've uh, been on retreats, in yoga, and eight years of yoga, and all that kind of stuff. I'm thinking to myself, and what are you saying? I should read meditation for dummies. But he lent me his copy. I drove off with it. I've got home and I started reading it. It's really good. Yeah, have an open mind, eh? The bloke eight months sober can teach me. Absolutely. When my dad died, the bloke that helped me the most was only six weeks sober. So I'll give that book. I'll pass it on. I bought a job, a lot of them, on Amazon. You know, I'll charge people for the books. You know, I don't give them, because I can't afford to do that. You know, I say, you can have this book, you've got to pay me for it. You pay me when you've got the money. You know, cause otherwise you could end up in a situation where uh, the sponsee down the line thinks he has to give them away. Yeah, it's a financial burden, isn't it? He might be skinned. I mean, I, could, I can probably give away a few books. I ain't completely broke. I, I wouldn't want to pass that on as a message to that other person. Yeah. And we continue down that path. We talk about uh, chapter 7, and I'll, t- I'll talk to him when we read through that chapter about the context of that chapter and how things have changed in AA. See, when that chapter was written in 1939, the route into AA for most people was uh, that they'd work the program, so they'd be 12 steps at the side of a bed, you know, by an AA member, and quite often they'll have worked the steps before even attending the meeting. You know, that would have been their experience. When they came to meetings to bear witness about what had happened to them. Nowadays, the vast majority of people that come to AA come either via the telephone service or treatment centre. You know, and their first contact's generally at the meeting. You know, I don't know, there's very few people that I've met in my years of recovery that have actually worked the steps before going to an AA meeting. So the way things that are delivered now are slightly different to the way that they used to be. And in some way, shape or form, my belief is that the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous need to try and replicate that process that the man at the bed used to do in Chapter 7. So the meeting's about trying to promote that what the condition is, what the understanding of that condition is, offering the man hope that there maybe there is a solution and that solution might be spiritual. The role of the meeting becomes more important now than ever before. And then often what we find is that through if your meeting's like that and can promote that, often people will then ask for help in the form of a sponsor and then that stuff can occur like it used to in the old days. But it's changed now. It's never going to go back, right? so we work with what we got. I personally think it's better, actually. You know, so many routes into AA now, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Absolutely wonderful. You, know, you, don't, have to, you don't have to rely on some random bloke turning up at the side of your bed when you're in, in your, at uh, the end of your life in a, in a living unit. <laughs> 
you know. So, and then uh, I'll send him away with a different type of meditation, maybe after that meeting, to practice for a few weeks, get some experience with a different way of meditating. And uh, getting back in six weeks' time, and we'll do, uh, do the chapter to the wife, family afterwards we do, and the vision for you. I don't normally go through the chapter to the employer. I have in recent times stopped going through the chapter to the wife as well. But I do promote that they read that on their own time. But I'll read through the family afterwards with them, and I'll read through the vision for you. And then what you find is that that process altogether takes normally about three to four months. And then it might be that after that, you'd have some various sit-downs with meditations and inventories and stuff like that. But gradually I'll increase the period of time between contact. You know, so I'm constantly easing the man away from me, helping him to rely on his tools of recovery. And then, uh, for a lot of people, that's all they want. You know, there's been many, many men that I've sponsored who've never wanted anything additional to that. So my involvement with them has been like for three, four, five months. And they've gone on and lived their life, and I don't hear from them anymore. Yeah. There's some people that have wanted ongoing sponsorship in the form of spiritual guidance, and I'll offer them the stuff that I found useful to myself. I'll always encourage people to follow their own conscience as well. You know, I don't think that this stuff's about any kind of rigidity for me. You know, if you if you pick up a book that inspires you, just because your sponsor's not read it or not recommended it, doesn't mean it's harmful. Yeah? It's about what you want to do with that. You know, but I will pass on things that I found useful and work with people for as long as they want me to, really. Other other ways of writing inventory, different ways of doing stuff that I've learned over the years, um, extended third column processes, uh, ways of looking at some of that spiritual manager stuff that we call in AA, uh, current agnosticism around various behaviours and things like that have nothing to do with drinking. They're often about later recovery and you know ongoing change through that spiritual awakening. You know, and I'll pass on everything that I know uh, free of charge. Uh, Cost nothing. Marvellous, isn't it? What do I get out of that? I get to be free. Right? I get to grow with people. Yeah? I don't impose myself. You know, Sometimes I do think that some people would be better off if they read certain books. Things like that. But I'm mindful of the fact that it's up to them. Yeah. You don't have to. Somebody give me a copy of The Power Now. The bloke that gave it to me was only a year sober. So I stuck it on the shelf. It was on my shelf for three years, that book. And one day I picked it up, started to read it, and changed my life. So I'm aware, you know, that for people, things come in their own time often. So there are blokes that I've worked with, I've had no contact with for a few years, maybe. One day they turn up on the drive, come in for a coffee, you know, and we start again. It's a new deal. As long as they want it, I'll never bring it to them. I encourage people to seek a new experience. You know, there's some blokes I, I actually think I've been sponsoring them far too long. I well, should probably go somewhere else, but I would never say that to them. Because you know, it's up to them. Some of my best friends in the world are people that I sponsor. You know, that can be, you know, sometimes you think, well, what's that dynamic look like? And for me, it's really not been a problem. You know, it really hasn't. You know, uh, best man at my wedding was a bloke that I sponsored, and I'm going to be best man at his wedding next year. For me, it's, it's never been a problem, that stuff. Uh, we journey together, uh, shoulder by shoulder, arm in arm, with a fellowship. Right? Fellowship grows up around us. You know, I've played small parts in lots of people's recovery, large parts in some people's recovery. You know, sometimes I sit back in awe at kind of what God can do through us. See blokes recreate their life. Blokes who had nothing going on at all. You know, they end up back in employment. End up getting a qualification. End up getting married. Moving to other countries, experiencing different things in life. Clean and sober. Twelve step in their family members. They carry a message to other people and it just grows. Wonderful. You could miss it. If you're not careful. It's up to you. 
Do you want that or not? That's all that's required. There need be no fear around being a sponsor. Just use the book. Just use the book. Do what the book says. If you're uncertain, ask somebody else. Have a go. But if you really want to help people, you'll find people to help. You will. They'll come to you. And you will help them. And you'll see people recreate their lives. You know, I was at a meeting last night and there was a couple of people there that I hadn't seen for seven or eight years, you know, and we used to knock around together years ago and stuff like that. It was just marvellous, just catching up on what happened in the last seven or eight years in these people's lives and my lives, my life, kind of how, how we're living, how we're living, right? So what is all this about, really? Why are we here? What, what are we doing in this room? What, what's the point of all of this nonsense I've been talking about? It's so that you can live your life with the least amount of personal suffering. Who wants that deal? I do. Talking with his folk last night, and great. We were filled with joy. We were filled with joy, just having, you know, oh, you're doing this, you're working there. Oh, it's fantastic. Brilliant, isn't it? Hopeless alcoholic of us. Hopeless. No direction. No purpose. Didn't know what life was about. Didn't really want it. Was angry, resentful. Completely self-centered, self-absorbed. Put the world over your living. Arrogant. Got a purpose in my life. Purpose. See, if you ever any doubt, this will be my last line. Yeah. Thank God there was that. If you ever in any doubt what God's will is for you today, the twelfth step will tell you. And what it says is, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. That's it. That's my purpose. If we live in that, my life is wonderful. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.